Hello. Welcome to our webinar. This is the second part of our webinar in the series Relevant Conditions, Relevant Answers, The Secrets to Truly Controlled Cell Experiments for Stem Cell Research. And um, today um, we'll be sharing some insight from uh, three organizations that, um, that provide solutions, uh, provide um, knowledge that uh, you'll find helpful in carrying out stem cell related experiments. Let me introduce our speakers. Dr. Alicia Hen, Chief Scientific Officer for Biospherics. Jake Boy, Senior Application Scientist for Scientific Bioprocessing. And Dr. Shersi Alm, Head of Biology at Phase Holographic Imaging. Um, our webinar format will be uh, about 12 minute presentations um, followed by a question and answer session at the conclusion of the webinar. Um, if you have questions, um, please use the chat function in the webinar and we will try to answer them. Um, if we're unable to answer them in the, in the webinar event, then uh, we will provide some follow-up post-event for it. So let me begin by um, starting with um, Shirsti Am as our first speaker. Thank you, Ray, for that presentation. Um, in the next 15 minutes, I will talk shortly about why the choice of experimental conditions and the workflow setup are important for stem cell research. I will also talk a bit about how our amazing PHI Holo monitor works and give you a taste of the results it can produce. So why are the experiment conditions important for stem cell research? Well, stem cells live in a rather complicated microenvironment. There are stem cells, there are signal molecules, there are supporting cells, there are extracellular matrix, but there are also more physical parameters in that environment. It's the O2 level, the pH, and the temperature. As long as these factors remain stable, the stem cells remain stable. But if any factor in the stem cell microenvironment changes, the stem cells will start to differentiate out. It's important to keep them in as stable an environment as possible. To do that, people usually put the stem cells in cell culture incubators. That's the way all cell culture biologists try to keep the environment stable. There we have regulated O2 levels, there is a regulated pH and a regulated temperature. Unfortunately, we don't really treat these parameters with care. Every time we open the door, we move the sample, we take something in or out, or one of our colleagues pick their cells out from the incubator. Any experiment we have will be in conditions that change. The pH will change, the O2 levels will change, the temperature will drop. So the most important thing for the stem cell researcher is to keep the experiment conditions um, stable and controlled. Uh, the partners in this webinar series Biospherics with Dr. Hen and SBI with Dr. Boy will talk more about measuring O2 levels or gas levels to keep its state, the conditions um, controlled, but also how to work in a controlled climate chamber. So how can we contribute to that? And we, that's face holographic imaging. We make a small holomonitor microscope that you can actually put inside your incubator. That makes working the, with the holo monitor um, beneficial for the cells. The, the environment is stable and cell friendly. And because of the way that microscope works, there is no phototoxicity, there is no um, labeling necessary, no staining. The cells are kept in their normal happy life cell culture vessels. So how does that work? So the holo monitor measures, in essence, how much the light is delayed when it passes through cells. Cells are small and see-through, but even so, whenever a light wave passes through, passes through the cells, 
the light would be delayed. That's what we measure. The computer converts those measurements into cell images, like this. You can see the bar, the color bar in the image, that the dark is the background, and the lighter it is, the thicker is the cell in that point. So the computer will draw these images for us based on the measurements of the light delay. To make the images look nicer, we often put on coloring, artificial coloring. This is no labels, no stains, just colors to show the thickness of the cells. So in this example, blue cells are thick and pink cells are thin. So the hollow monitor in the incubator will fit into an experimental workflow. I will now make a comparison with a standard workflow. So you start out, you have time for your experiment. You prepare for that experiment. You seed your cells, then you check after a while if they're ready, usually 24 hours, and you add a treatment, and then you start the incubation. Then, every few hours, you remove a sample for analysis. Then, at the end of the incubation, you begin your data analysis. This is a pretty straightforward experimental workflow that most people use. Using the Holo monitor, you can make that workflow smoother, more self-friendly, um, with less impact on that of environmental fluctuations on your cell sample. That goes like this. First, use your you can use your Holo monitor to count cells. Prepare prepare for experiment. Feed cells is the same. You can not just check if your cells are ready for an experiment. With stem cells, you usually want to measure, is the morphology correct? Did something change in the culture? So using the Holo monitor, you can get actually hard numbers, quantify that your cells are okay. Then to introduce treatments, you set it up to Im capture images and then you just walk away. No removing samples for analysis. Instead, at the end of capture, graphs are ready. Making the workflow this much smoother is beneficial for stem cells. There's less impact on them, less risk that they change because of the environmental effects. In addition, you can take that same, exactly same stem cell sample that you used to set up the experiment and run other analyses with other methods, protein extraction, DNA extraction, just saying whatever, because the samples are non-labeled and not affected by whatever measurements you've been doing. And also, you can reanalyze the data with other applications in the Holo monitor to get more information. If you set the experiment up to measure the motility of stem cells, for example, you can also choose then to analyze them for cell growth or for cell morphology. So you can get a lot of different parameters out from one experiment. You don't have to rerun the experiment. So what can you get out then? Um, mostly cell morphology is interesting. These images here show cells that have been treated with colsamid, which is a G2 arresting substance. The left image shows controlled cells, T0, no treatment. As you can see, they're all kind of very different. Then to the right, you have after 48 hours, above there is control and below there is treated. And they are very different. You can see that. You get the thickness of the cells, that's the coloring again, but you can also get hard data out. How thick are they? How large are they? What is the actual difference? So if you look in the top graph, you can see that in control cells, no big shift has happened in area or thickness over 48 hours. If you look at the lower graph, you can see that the Colsimid treatment caused a great shift in cell morphology. The, the orange um, little boxes are the control or the start, the zero hour test, while the blue ones, the blue squares, 
are the treated cells after 48 hours. They have become much larger. And you can see that, that's hard data. So, Patecha and colleagues have used morphology to look at changes in stem cells. How, if you try to differentiate out the stem cell to the mature adipocyte, in this case an osteoblast, if you break that process and shift the cells over to something else, what happens morphology-wise? So if you look at the left image, you can see they start out with a stem cell, they treated it with medium, which is adipocyte medium or osteoblast medium. And the stem cells developed into mature adipocytes or mature osteoblasts. That's what you see in the top graph as well. The green is the stem cells and the brown triangles are the osteoblasts and the light yellow triangles correspond to the adipocytes and its thickness versus roughness. When you look at the cells that were forced to shift mid-experiment from being a nice pre-adipocyte to become suddenly an osteoblast or opposite from a pre-osteoblast to adipocyte, you can see in the lower diagram that the cells have they, they get the same morphology as the mature adipocytes that have been going straight there, but a little bit more exaggerated. It's the same with the osteoblasts. They get the same morphology, but a bit more exaggerated. What you also can do with the hollow monitor is to track cells over time. In this little movie, you see the trails showing where the cells have been. So wherever they move, they can be followed and analyzed. Example is these tracks showing how all cells move in the one direction. This is an example from a chemotaxis. And each little line is an individual cell. You can also, for each time point, for each part of the road, you can see how the morphology changed for that, each individual cell in the sample. So in the example to the right, the green line shows the optical volume of the cell and how that shifts over time. When you see that there is a straight decrease like this, it's usually a cell division. So you get the volume going up, cell division, volume going up, cell division. You can follow each cell with about 30 different morphology parameters. So Osten and his colleagues, they compared the morphology and the movement for multipotential stromosome cells from two different sources. They used the periostom from bone, which is something that's more or less readily available, or bone marrow from donors, bone marrow donors, and compared if the uh, multipotential stem cells that they could pick from either tissue was better or different or anything. So if you look to the right and you see the oblong purple cells, they are the, what's considered the normal morphology of these stem cells. While the top one, the little white round ones, are thicker and that's the cells rounding up to divide or they have just divided. So they just took a look at the, at the bone marrow versus periostom stem cells to see if there was a difference in morphology and cell surface area and cell thickness. And you could see in the periostom, you have much more of the small rounded up cells. That's the great cloud to the left. In the bone marrow, there are much fewer of those. What they also did was looking at cell motility. How did the source of the multipotential stem cells affect their, their motility characteristics? So they could see that the bone marrow stem cells, that's the dark staples to the left, moved faster than the periostom stem cells. And they could see that this was a straight line over time as well. What they also did was that they took the small periostom stem cells or bone marrow cells versus the larger ones and saw how, if there was a difference in how they moved. That's the two diagrams with the lines like this, and the darker line is the smaller cells. And the um, light gray line corresponds to the larger cells. 
So they investigated in depth the morphology and the movement of these different stem cells. And they wanted to see if they could use the periostom as a source of stem cells instead of the bone marrow. And their conclusion is that, yes, it's possible. So what else more can you do with a holo monitor? You can count cells. I already spoke quickly about that. You can look at cell proliferation, cell motility. You can make dose response assays. You can track single cells, individual cells. You can get morphology data out and you can do wound healing assays. We have the guided assays versus the in-depth assays. For the guided assays, step by step, the, the experiment is set up, and in the end, you get out the one graph you need, proliferation, for example. For the in-depth assays, instead, you dig in and you extract the data you want and you need, and it is the user who decides which data comes out. But the holo monitor does not only provide hard data, it also provides beautiful images and movies. This movie here shows you human iPS stem cells. To the right, you can see that the cells bungle up and some of them become quite orange and then they divide quickly. That's the normal way for the cells to divide. If you now keep an eye to the left, did you have a chance to see that exploding cell? It died quickly. There are more exploding cells in this movie and you can see them everywhere. So every time a cell is orange and pops up, it either divides or it dies. So thick cells have, have a really a harsh outcome, live or die. You can also see that these stem cells cluster together in big piles. So, one second of this movie corresponded to one hour of cell life. So thank you very much for listening and thank you Ray for introducing everything. I would like to hand the, the, everything over to you again now Ray. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Sharesty. Um, thank you for sharing your insight uh, concepts about accomplishing cell-based experiments, stem cell-based experiments under physiologic conditions and uh, uh, confirming them uh, visually via methods that uh, uh, avoid damaging the cells, um, avoid introducing artifact and labels, which can uh, skew results and alter their, their morphological characteristics. Um, please remember, if you have questions for Sharesty or any of the speakers, um, to go ahead and use the chat function in the webinar, um, and uh, or I'm sorry, the, the question function in the, in the webinar. Um, if we're unable to answer those questions at the conclusion, um, we will follow up with you um, aside to provide answer. So next up is uh, senior application scientist from scientific bioprocessing, and. Um, Mr. Jake Boy will be sharing some insight um, about how his organization, SBI, helps stem cell scientists provide relevant conditions for relevant answers. Thank you, Jake. All right. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, and I appreciate the introduction and that awesome presentation, Shesty. I, I couldn't really get enough of watching those uh, those videos of the cells. That's really amazing, unlike anything else that I've ever seen. Um, so anyways, we'll get started here. So um, today I'm going to talk to you guys about optical sensors. Optical sensors are um, a new sensing technology and um, really, really helpful for you know a lot of different cell culture work, including stem cells. So First, a little bit about our company. Um, we're Scientific Bioprocessing, SBI for short, and we are uh, a subsidiary of a much older company called Scientific Industries, and Scientific Industries invented the Vortex Genie, so that little box that you know shakes all of your tubes for you and mixes things up. I'm sure many of you have seen it before. Um, so when it comes to sensors, there are a few things that we think you know you really can't compromise on. Number one, the sensors must be reliable and they must provide real-time monitoring um, in the smallest to largest vessel. The sensors need to have uh, the ability to provide automatic control in a closed loop. 
they must provide relevant physiological parameters at the cellular level, now that's really important, and they must be economically remarkable, um, or in other words, inexpensive. Uh, so I'll start off by talking about the FDA just a little bit and uh, the PAT initiative in particular. So, you know, a lot of us back when we could go to the conferences and, and meet in person, we, there would be a lot of talk, uh, a lot of FDA officials and a lot of talk from um, folks at the FDA about different regulations that are coming down uh, that we need to be aware of as we progress as companies and in the biotech space. And one of the things they, they really are, are harping on a lot these days is the PAT initiative. And really this is just trying to control manufacturing, uh, get to GMP manufacturing so that our products become not just R&D uh, projects, but get, you know, become regulated and certified and eventually move to the clinical phase. And this is really important for stem cell work in particular. So uh, we want to make sure that we're following these FDA regulations so that we're positioning ourselves to have success in the future. And where optical sensors fit in with this, so part of controlling manufacturing, part of standardizing your process is being able to use consistent methodology throughout the entire experiment, the entire design of experiment. Optical sensors are the only sensing modality that you can use in the smallest culture vessels, as well as the largest bioreactors or culture, culture vessel systems. So this one sensing system, you can use it throughout your R&D process all the way through scaling up and you know the whole process can be accommodated by one sensing system. Um, so traditional sensors, things like Clark electrodes and traditional electrochemical probes just don't work in things like T flasks and shake flasks and uh, particularly microfluidics devices. You can't really get inline sensing in these devices using traditional sensing methods. So optical sensors really address this issue. And here is some data. This is taken um, in Petri dishes. So just some small Petri dishes um, in a CO2 incubator. And these are using our pH sensor. So these pH sensors are in these tiny little Petri dishes growing in CO2 incubators. And we're able to monitor the pH in real time, in line, non-invasive, using these optical sensors. So, Another really great use case. So Aquila is a company out of Germany and they make biomass sensors. And <clears throat> they're looking to use our sensors in conjunction with theirs to monitor some of the microbial work, <clears throat> excuse me, that they're doing. So here's some of the data that we've got from that. Um, and this is really, really cool stuff to look at. So here we have in the orange line, the pH. In the blue line, we have the dissolved oxygen. And then the backscatter, that's meant as a proxy for the biomass. And what we're seeing here in, in this fermentation experiment is when the dissolved oxygen actually drops down and becomes hypoxic, the cells begin to proliferate at a much higher rate. And this is what's expected, but it's really nice to be able to see this data and you can actually see the exact timing of when this is happening for this experiment. And again, here we have similar data. Um, again, the dissolved oxygen is in blue and as it drops, the cells um, during fermentation really begin to proliferate at a high level. And you can also see the pH drop here in this instance because the media becomes more acidic when this shift occurs. Really, really interesting data um, that really was not available to us in something like a shake flask, which is where they did this experiment. So introducing the ID developers kit. This is our most basic product offering. And just to give everyone kind of a, a visual about what we're talking about, this is a lot of niche and new information. So it's nice to be able to see it. Um, so you can have it in your mind what this looks like as I talk about it here. Um, so here we see some of the reading devices and you can see all the different small culture vessels that we can accommodate using this system. There's a multi-well plate, there's a shake flask, um, there's an evaporating dish, and then there's a T75 um, as well. So you can see that these sensors can accommodate a lot of form factors of culture vessels that really, you know, we couldn't monitor before. So a little bit about optical sensors and you know what they're capable of. And this is a really important reference point for people who are not familiar with this technology. So here we see they have really, really quick response times. These things are extremely accurate. Um, but some of the really important things to note is that they are they come pre-calibrated. So recalibration is not necessary with this sensing type. They can be steam sterilized, they can be gamma irradiated. So you can imagine, you know, if you have a bioreactor or some culture vessel and you place the sensor inside, you can sterilize that entire unit so that the sensor 
uh, essentially becomes part of the culture vessel and you never have to go back in and risk contamination or draw a sample or anything like that to get real time sensing. Um, the sensors, another great part about these is that they can be really, really small. So the standard size that we like to use is one centimeter squares and they're 0.3 millimeters tall, um, just so you can, like a couple pieces of paper stacked on top of each other more or less in height. Uh, but we can actually get these things down to three millimeter spots. So three millimeter diameter spots that are 0.3 millimeters tall, just a tiny, tiny little thing, um, kind of like a sticker that goes on the inside of your culture vessel. And I'll show you what that looks like a little later. So microfluidics devices. Um, this is a great, great part of you know, the, bio, the biotech world that is just waiting to explode. It's coming in to replace animal testing. It's, it's much less expensive. Um, it's not as time intensive. You don't have to you know, keep all the animal colonies alive and thriving. Um, obviously all the ethical issues that go along with, with animal testing. So using things like organ on a chip devices and microfluidics devices allow us to, uh, to run experiments really high throughput at a much lower cost. And another really great thing about them is that we can use human tissue in these devices um, instead of animal analog. So we're getting really relevant physiological data when we use things like this. Now, optical sensors, you would never imagine, right, that there'd be a way to do inline real-time sensing in a device that's on the micro scale. Optical sensors, however, allow you to do just that. And there are three ways that we like to approach something like an organ on a chip system. So here you see on the right an image of an organ on a chip setup. Everything here is really tiny, as you can imagine. But the optical sensors can fit in in three main ways in this system. First, the perfusion loop. We have a flow cell where the optical sensor sits inside of the flow cell and it integrates um, into the perfusion lines. So you can put the sensor in the feeding line, you can put it in the waistline as it comes out and you can measure the media in both of those places. You can also place the sensor in the media reservoir as well as the waste media to check the differences and to monitor those. And Better yet, you can put the sensor inside of the organ on a chip device itself if geometry allows. And here I'll show you an image of that. So here we have three millimeter optical pH sensors. And these are the white spots that you can see here in this organ on a chip device. So those are three millimeter sensors. These are embedded in this chip. Another really, really great thing about these sensors is they don't require a great fill volume. They're not um, using the media. They're not, um, they're not you know, actually taking up any of that volume. So we can use volumes that are really on the micro scale when we're doing the sensing. And in this um, case right here, we're using a 10 microliter fill volume. So just enough to wet the sensor essentially um, to do our sensing here. So you can see that these sensors are really versatile because of their size. So now I'll talk a little bit about the T flask, something that everyone is familiar with, but you know, uh, this is kind of, you know, T-flasks, they're old news, everyone knows about them, but what do you really know about them? And this might surprise you. So here we have data, and this is using optical sensors in a T-225 flask, and we're using a four millimeter liquid depth. So a pretty standard setup here in a CO2 incubator. And what we have here running in parallel is one of the flasks with a partially open lid and one of the flasks with a closed lid. Now, this is like one of those myths that people in cell culture use, I've used it myself in the past without really knowing why, just assuming it would work. But the thought here is if we crack the lid of the tea flask, it allows the gas from the incubator to enter the flask and ultimately feed the cells the oxygen that they need. What the researchers are showing here is that this is not what happens at all. The gas in the incubator never gets down to the cells and particularly as the cells are pro proliferating, metabolizing, using up that oxygen, it's much faster than the transfer rate of the liquid that allows the gas to get down to the cells. Here we see in the partially open flask after about you know, 60 hours, so after a couple of days, um, the cells are becoming nearly anoxic. Maybe they do actually become anoxic um, before they reach a hypoxic level you know, many hours later. And in the closed flask, we see almost the exact same thing. The cells are becoming anoxic again after just a couple of days. And if this is alarming to you, it really should be because this is something that no one knows really, no one talks about because we've never been able to gather this data before. But now using optical sensors, this whole world of, of what's really happening in these culture devices is open to us. And if you're growing stem cells and if you're differentiating stem cells, this is really, really important. 
you need to know what's happening in these culture devices where your cells are, particularly as they're differentiating. Um, we want to maintain, you know, genetic stability and get the right cell line when we come out of this. So what the scientists realize is that the liquid layer acts as an insulator. It does, you know, oxygen is not very diffusible into liquid. And so that oxygen cannot make its way through that liquid layer, no matter how shallow that liquid is, um, to get down to the cells to keep up with the metabolism of the cells. So T flasks are overwhelmingly mass transfer limited, not very good KLA. And the authors thought that maybe we can gently agitate this media as a way to allow the oxygen to get down to the cells by breaking up that insulating layer a little bit. So here's the experimental setup they use. They have a T flask. This here is a T75. They have a T75 on top of the incubator. Um, in figure A, you can see statically, they have a T75 on a rocking platform here, and they have the optical sensor in figure B, you can see placed there inside of this flask. Um, and you know this is a really rudimentary setup. They just kind of uh, took a rocking platform and, and strapped a T flask to it, but it, it really uh, provided some great data, which I'll show you here. So this is really striking stuff, um, you know, and I'll dive into figure C and D here in just a second, but a couple of things to note. The cell cultures in the rocking flask grew a lot faster. Uh, the cell density was much higher. They produced way less lactate. Um, and the physiologically relevant conditions were maintained. Um, so obviously this led to healthier, happier cells. Here we, we can see figure D. This is showing the pH. The rocking flask is in red. The static flask is in black. And what we see here is that the agitated flask maintained much more physiologically relevant levels of pH than did the static flask. The static flask dipped you know, to a really acidic level, a dangerously acidic level. And the pH in the rocking platform allowed that media to maintain a higher physiologically relevant pH. How is this possible? As the cells are metabolizing, they build up CO2. That CO2 is heavy, it has an extra carbon as compared to the oxygen, and it sits down on top of the cells. Not only does it acidify them, but it also starves them of oxygen. And this creates a pocket of high acidity right at the paracellular level. So the rest of the media, you know, you might draw a media sample if you're doing offline testing, for example, but that sample might be from a pocket where the pH is different from where the cells are actually growing. These optical sensors go on the bottom of the vessel and we're really measuring what is happening at the cellular level. As the media rocks back and forth, that CO2 is broken up and it is diluted in the media so that all of the media is more of a uniform pH rather than just a pocket of acidity where the cells are sitting. And then with the oxygen, we see here again, the rocking flask is in red, the, the, uh, the static flask is in black. And as these cells are, as this flask is rocking, that oxygen level never really dips down below 70%. In the static flasks, you can see again, consistently around 60 hours, that's, that flask is becoming anoxic. The cells are being starved of oxygen. So it's really, really important to know that this is happening in your flasks and that there are things you can do about it to maintain a more physiologically relevant condition for your cells as they're growing, as they're differentiating. So hypoxia and stem cell research. Now hypoxia is really, really important when we're talking with stem cells. And this is, you know, everything we just showed you with being able to monitor what's happening in your culture vessel and knowing what's happening in there is really important if you want to have the best success when you're working with cells that are differentiating with cells that you're trying to keep healthy when you're trying to select for a particular cell line that's genetically stable. And things we see here, this, there's literature all about this that you know, there are stem cells that under hypoxic conditions, um, they are healthier and they, ha you know, they are not differentiating when we don't want them to. Um, and we can precondition cells in hypoxic conditions um, as, as well as you know, when we see um, oxygen concentrations that are too high, the cells are actually losing their ability to differentiate properly. So it's really, really important to maintain uh, the level of oxygen that we want when we're working with cells like this. So a little bit about our technology. So this is the ID reader. This is what sends, so this whole, this whole optical sensing is based on fluorescence. And what we really have is a sticker. It's kind of like a patch, uh, the three millimeter spot that goes inside of a culture vessel. 
and there are no wires or anything coming out of the culture vessel. It's in there isolated, uh, so truly non-invasive. And when we, uh, so we send light through the wall of the culture vessel using this reading device that causes that little sticker patch to fluoresce, and then we get a dissolved oxygen or pH reading based off of that. So here we can see kind of how it works. In yellow, we have a culture vessel. There are some protons floating around, some oxygen molecules. And you can see the light coming up through the wall of the culture vessel um, that then strikes that sensor patch that's sitting inside of the culture vessel. And if you have a form factor, like a bioreactor, for example, that does not allow for that standard coaster form factor, then we have fiber optic um, fiber optic options available. And here are some of the ways that those work. So we have a fiber optic probe where you can insert the fiber optics into this probe. This goes into the port space of a bioreactor. And the great thing about this fiber optic probe is that it's disposable. You can throw it away. It's inexpensive. When you're finished with your run, you toss it and you just get a new one for the next one. There are sensors affixed to the tip of that probe. You can do pH and dissolved oxygen in a very, very small amount of port space using this device. We also have the external star adapter. This is meant to stick, as you can see in the, in the image there, to the side or the wall of any culture vessel. So you can place a sensor anywhere you want to in your culture vessel and attach the fiber optic with this adapter. And then at the very bottom here, we have the flow cell, which I mentioned before. Um, there's a sensor inside of this flow cell, and this integrates with your perfusion line or your feeding line so that you can monitor the media as it's flowing through. So environmental control is really important. We talked about this before. This is the rocker that we offer. Um, and this is really just you know, talking about what those researchers found in that paper that you need to agitate the media in your culture vessels when they're in a CO2 incubator if you want them to experience the gas environment that you have in that incubator. Um, so this rocking device agitates the media and allows that to happen. We ha here have the ID shaker. This is really your standard shaker table, but the magic is the flask holder. Um, it's a custom flask holder that affixes the reader to the shaker deck, and then you can put the shake flask on top of that. So as it's shaking, nothing is shifting around, and you can have real-time monitoring in your shaker vessels. And then here we have our custom suite of software. Uh, this really, you know, I won't spend a lot of time here, it just displays the data for you and also provides data logging and has interactive um, graphical displays. So you can get real-time sensing here. You can have sensing as quickly as every 10 seconds, and you can log all of that data for as long as your experiment runs. So we know people are really interested in a lot of metabolites, a lot of analytes. Um, so we right now offer the most basic pH and dissolved oxygen, but in the future, in the very near future, we have glucose and lactate um, on the way. Uh, here is the bibliography. If anyone wants to check out the study or anything I talked about here today, um, I think we're recording this so anyone can look at this. We may also be sending out the presentations uh, to anyone who asks for it. Um, so with that, I want to thank everyone for listening today, and I hope this stimulated your imaginations and what is possible using optical sensors. Well, thank you. Tim, thank you, Jake. Um, we appreciate your insight and uh, sharing more information about uh, the technology from scientific bioprocessing, um, how it corrects some of the deficiencies that uh, are exhibited by other sensing technologies, um, through a non-invasive uh, optical sensing method that provides an extreme level of information for stem cell experiments and uh, really has a lot of flexibility and utility um, that is uh, universally applied to uh, a variety of stem cell applications and, and many other uh, cellular-based settings. And uh, with that, I'd like to present, um, I'd, I'd like to turn the meeting over to my colleague, Dr. Alicia Hen, Chief Scientific Officer for Biospherics, where she will share uh, her insight and um, some technological considerations for carrying out stem cell experiments under truly con controlled conditions that, uh, uh, which are relevant and for providing relevant answers. Go ahead, Alicia. Thanks, Ray. Now, Biospherics, we build everything from a cytocentric point of view. And to describe this, I'm going to start with a, a short mental vacation. And if you're with me in the last webinar, you heard a little of this, but I'm going to take uh, people that have joined us 
uh, new here today through this too. So let's take a moment and actually close our eyes. And we're gonna take a minute to build our own private island. Now take a deep breath, imagine a piece of land. It's got mountains, it's got valleys, give it some rivers, surrounded by ocean, give it some beaches. Now picture your favorite animal, you know, whether it's a polar bear or a river dolphin or a lemur. And now give your island a latitude and longitude for the right climate. Does your animal have all the things it needs to support it? Does it have the, the right food chain? Does it have the right flora and fauna? What are the right conditions for that animal? Now watch your animal for a minute. What's it doing? Is it doing something weird? Is it doing something you didn't expect? Is that normal for that animal? What's it responding to? Can you figure that out with what you have on your island, isolated from everything else in the world, all the variability that comes from everywhere else in the world? What if you did something to change its behavior? Now open your eyes, come back to me. Let's talk about doing the same thing for a cell environment in your lab. What if you could design any environment for your cells? Have all the tools inside it that you need to study those cells. The oxygen, the CO2, the temperature, the humidity would be like the latitude and longitude on your, on your island, like the climate there. What in your lab is designed to support the needs of cells right now? And can that do it all? Now, a lot of people think of this. They think of your traditional cell culture incubator. You know, it's technology, it's been around for 70 years, but I'm gonna make the case today that this is actually not designed for the needs of cells at all. It's designed for the needs of people. It's easy to get your hands in there, it's easy to get your face in there, uh, but if you think about it, that water pen in the bottom is always contaminated, um, so it's a contamination risk for your cells. Uh, the, Temperature might be okay as long as the door is shut and the CO2 might be okay as long as the door is shut, but every time you open it with, or someone else in the lab opens it to get their cells, all those conditions change. And the oxygen level is far higher than anything that you find in the body. It's super physiologic. So this is really people-centric incubation and these conditions are irrelevant for what we want to study in our cells. So at Biospherics, we designed cytocentric incubation. These are incubators that open into a physiologically relevant cell handling space. So you have full-time relevant conditions where the air is at 37 degrees, the atmosphere is actually composed of tanked gases. So you can have physiologically relevant oxygen, constant 5% CO2. So you have relevant conditions to handle those cells. Now, if you need to handle them in a traditional room air setting, of course, you end up with something like this, a BSC, and that's even worse for the cells. Not only is it super physioxic uh, and there's no CO2, but now they're cold and the risk of contamination is by far the highest, of course, in this point, and totally irrelevant conditions for the cells. Cytocentric cell handling, even the floor is warm to 37 degrees. So your cells are never cold. They're never out of optimum conditions. So you don't have to rush through what you're doing. The cells are safe. It's like being able to reach into the incubator and do everything that you need with all the right tools while the cells are in their, their own private island of perfect conditions. You can have microscopes inside or cell sorters or any kind of cell analysis equipment like the IncuSight or the Seahorse, you name it, we can put it inside a cell relevant environment. So more generally, the ex vivo system protects the entire process. You can bring the cells into there when they come into the lab, they stay inside all the time until you have your experiments done, until you have your data done, and they never have to come out into the people-centric lab, into out into our space where the conditions are wrong for them. You control the oxygen, the CO2, just by typing in whatever level you want for them. So if you could type in whatever oxygen level you wanted for your cells and for your stem cells, you, we end up in the three L's of physiology, right? Location, 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 because oxygen is different everywhere in the body, but it's all lower than room air oxygen. If you look at the bone marrow niche, you have a uh, blood flow that it, it goes through the sinusoidal um, blood vessels that spread out very thin and flat and blood 
flow actually slows down through these blood vessels, which reduces the oxygen level that the cells get there because you're getting more oxygen consumed before that blood is turned over. So this is usually where I hear from people, well, I, okay, I know that stem cells are better in low oxygen. Uh, I've got a guy down the hall has an old tri-gas incubator that nobody's using because it uses too much gas and it's a pain in the neck, but I can just take my cells down there and when I need to take care of them, I'll just run them back up here to my own lab, take care of them real quick and then run them right back. It just takes a few minutes because I'm really quick and the, the majority of time the cells are at the right oxygen level. So, you know, that's good enough. Other people have done it this way. So, you know, that's good enough. Well, that might be what you see happening from the people-centric point of view, but this is what happens actually from the cytocentric point of view. This is what your cells are experiencing. Um, it takes almost, you can see here on the left, this is the oxygen levels in the medium at the pericellular level after a quick medium change at room air oxygen, and it takes almost two hours for these cells to get back to 3% oxygen after a quick room air medium change. And it takes almost three hours for the intracellular oxygen level to get back to optimum levels after a quick room air medium change. Now, last year, one of the Nobel Prizes went to the researchers that first described HIP-1-alpha, and I just want to draw your attention to the time span on this data that was some of the early data in describing HIP-1-alpha, just to show you that it actually takes single minutes for HIP-1-alpha to be modulated in response to oxygen changes like you would experience in a quick room air medium change. So three hours in suboptimal conditions is an eternity on a HIF-1 alpha scale. And downstream of HIF-1 alpha are all these critical cell uh, functions, such as differentiation and cell death, all of these critical cell signaling pathways, including NOTCH, including mTOR, that uh, are so critical to stem cell biology. And uh, we have over 3,000 customer publications now that back me up on this. These are a few publications just from this year um, where you can see our customers are using our systems to study how notch signaling enhances stemness by re regulating metabolic pathways. They're studying how P53 deficiency can change diverse cellular processes in physiologic oxygen. We're studying how COX-2 can lead to changes in uh, immune immunoprivilege of MSC. We've got people designing biomimetic microenvironments for MSC. And then this is a paper that came out actually late last year uh, about uh, from some researchers in Ottawa that are using physiologically relevant oxygen conditions to generate uh, re re uh, regenerative medicine therapeutics with uh, cardiac derived cells in physiologic oxygen and showing that this has huge benefits over growing them in room air conditions. So this is an ex vivo system that I actually had built for my laboratory. And what you can see here, we actually have six different incubators. These are these black doors, six different incubators all on a single cell, cell handling space. So I can have six different oxygen conditions running simultaneously and be able to set my cell processing chamber to match any one of these before I open the door. So the cells never know they're out of that one condition. It's also possible to say, have six different people each have their own incubator here. So nobody's messing up anyone else's experiments by, by opening the incubator door. The cells and the projects and the people all have separate islands, all physiologically relevant. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of data we have for MSC. We're running late, so it's only gonna be a little bit. Um, just to show you that in human bone marrow, MSC cells do grow much better in full-time controlled oxygen. These experiments in this case were at 5% oxygen. When you compare them with traditional cell culture room air, uh, they also grow much longer. We get more passages out of them before they senesce. And it's the same is true if you um, compare full-time oxygen control to controlling oxygen only for the incubation part and doing the cell handling in room air. You get much better growth under constant op optimal conditions. 
We actually use the PHI HOLA monitor M4 inside our ex vivo system, combining our technologies to look at the question of does hypoxic preconditioning benefit human bone marrow MSC more than having them in constant physiologic uh, conditions? Because this is something that a lot of uh, people will use to kind of, uh, it's almost like a little cheat. You, you grow the cells in, physi in room air conditions, non-physiologic conditions, and then for the last uh, day or two, you drop them down to 1% oxygen, and this boosts their uh, cell growth. It makes them graft better. They seem to have better therapeutic effect. So we decided to take a look at this and see what's going on using the, the M4 to look specifically at mitosis and mitotic events and mitotic cells. And what we saw was that, you know, the amount of time it took for the cells to divide was not changed at all, whether the cells were in constant physiologic oxygen, whether they had uh, culture only in room air, or whether they had, had been subjected to hypoxic preconditioning at 1% oxygen for different lengths of time. But what we did see is that we saw a difference in the number of cells that divided at all when cells were... Um, exposed to hypoxic preconditioning, we did get a boost in the number of cells that divided up to the number of cells that were dividing in the constant physio physioxia. We saw this drop in ones that were exposed to room air, which is what we would expect from our previous data. But we saw that that wasn't enough, this boost in mitotic rate was not enough to make up for all that time out of optimum conditions in room air. We still got larger cell numbers and better cell division in cells that were cultured under constant physiologic conditions. So you, this variation in conditions going up and down in oxygen is actually quite stressful for cells. And when they come out of a traditional room air incubator, like you see in this picture, not only does the oxygen goes off, but the CO2 goes off at two as well. And that changes your pH level. Your temperature goes off as well. And that's all very stressful for the cells. In fact, you can look at the cleanest clean room in the world, like the highest technology, pinnacle of technology for cell culture there is. And what you find is an incredibly people-centric environment. I mean, look at this picture. They have to keep these rooms cold because of all the layers of clothing that people have to wear in these spaces. So when you take these cells out of the incubator, they're even more stressed than they would in a more primitive lab. But they still have the same sources of variability that you'd find in any traditional cell culture lab anywhere in the world. The technology just doesn't address the needs of cells. In a cytocentric environment, you have full-time optimal conditions. And now you can take that environment and you can clone it and you can put it anywhere in the world. So I can have verifiably the same conditions, whether I'm working in San Diego or a friend is working in Stockholm or another collaborator is working in Shanghai, it doesn't matter. I can have verifiably the same conditions. So what's that do for scientific reproducibility? Now let's talk about this for a minute because when we start talking about scientific reproducibility, we see things about reagents. We see things about record keeping. We see things about reporting issues. We think things about cell identity. And all of these are important factors. They all can add variability into experiments, but they all add variability to different extents depending upon whether it's someone in the same lab trying to reproduce my results, whether it's a collaborator down the hall trying to reproduce my results, or whether it's someone halfway around the world picking up a paper and trying to read it and reproduce my results. But the one factor that adds variability into every single cell-based assay done anywhere on planet Earth is cell conditions. And this has to be a priority when we start talking about scientific reproducibility. So, you know, you can't figure out the rainforest by plunking a lemur down in the middle of Las Vegas. It's an irrelevant environment. You have to have relevant, constant conditions that we can control for biology. Physicists and chemists wouldn't do experiments like this. Only biologists do. And we only do it because we've been taught this is the way it's always been done. And I'm telling you, we don't have to now. You can control the conditions and do truly controlled um, biology in order to get the right answers for the people that are waiting for them out there. So here, I'm just showing you some pictures. We've done some work with PHI uh, as collaborators where we combine our technology. And now we are starting some studies using the ID rocker also from SBI to combine our technologies that way. So uh, I know we're coming up on the end, so I'm gonna stop talking and thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you, Alicia. Um, I'm going to encourage um, both uh, Jake and Sherstie to uh, go. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then also ensure that your microphones are, are live. Um, uh, Alicia, thank you for uh, challenging our paradigms and challenging the status quo approach to cell biology, which uh, has uh, unintended consequences and um, uh, really um, by correcting it and thinking about what cells truly need, um, a cytocentric way of thinking for, for cell experiments um, allows for uh, us to provide uh, relevant conditions in order to obtain relevant answers in stem cell experiments. So with, with that said, I'd like to, um, I, have a, I have a few questions here that I'd like to share with uh, our, our audience um, that, that uh, come from the attendees. Um, the first question that I have is to share, Steve, um, the, we received the question, so in order to culture stem cells, I use different coatings or, or matrix gel. Will that work in combination with, with a hollow monitor? Thank you, Ray. Yes, it will. All the coatings we have tried so far, collagen, polylysine, they work. And thin layers of matrigel is really not a problem. The last movie I showed in my presentation, those cells were actually running around on matrigel. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, and I'm sure uh, if there are additional questions, they can chat us and, and you can uh, expand um, alternately um, individually as well. Um, Absolutely. At, uh, thank you again, Sherstie. Um, I, have, I have a question here for Jake from Scientific Bioprocessing, and uh, the, the individual asks, um, how do you recommend we monitor pH levels and, and dissolved oxygen in our, in our tissue culture flasks? We usually have about 10 to 15 of the flasks in, in an incubator at, at a single time. Do we need to locate the sensors within each flask? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so, you know, T-flasks are meant to be stackable. They've got that little lip on the bottom that allows you to put one on top of the other. Um, so really what we recommend in a case like this, when you've got all these T-flasks, as long as it's the same cell line and, you know, all the conditions that you can really control are the same, you can have sensing in just one of those T-flasks and really use it as a sentinel to help you know what's happening in the rest of them. Um, and when you're having, a, you know, when you're using a lot of T-flasks like that, the geometry of the incubator doesn't allow for a lot of variability. So that's really the best way to approach it. Fantastic. Thank you, Jake. Um, and then I have one uh, final question to, for the time we have today. Um, this question is for Alicia from Biospherics. Um, the, the question is, what is the appropriate um, oxygen level or physiological oxygen level I should use for my stem cell experiments? Ooh, good question. Um, of course, that depends completely upon your cells. And what I'd invite, I know our time's short here, I'd invite you to contact me personally, and I'd be happy to send you to publications that would indicate an oxygen level to start with for an oxygen range to start with for your experiments. But generally bone marrow is, is pretty low. You're looking at between 1% and uh, about 5% oxygen. If you're looking at a bone marrow niche, if you're looking at a different niche, please contact me and we can talk about tissue specific appropriate oxygen levels. Um, thank you, Alicia. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, relevant conditions for relevant answers in stem cell research. Um, I'd like uh, to invite you to join us um, for another webinar, uh, which will be hosted by Scientific Bioprocessing and occurring in two weeks on November the 11th. Um, relevant conditions, relevant answers for use in in vitro drug development. Um, again, it's been our pleasure to uh, join you today. And um, if you have questions, again, please chat them to us and we will answer them post event. Thank you all. The webinar is now finished. Great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.